Welcome to session three of our discussion on introduction to electronic business. Now in this session, I want to discuss internet consumers and market research. Now, what I want to do in this session is to highlight the relevance of internet consumers and how to work with them online. So what I expect you to understand by the end of this session is the behavior of e-business consumers, understanding consumer purchase decision making, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to design and implement customer service in cyber cyberspace context, and also understand and explain market research in electronic business. Now, when we discuss customers in electronic context, we look at the importance of customers under the general label of the three C's, competition, the customers themselves, and the issue of change, change. Now, competition means that, look, in a cyber environment, you need to fight for customers, and you need to fight to retain these customers. And to succeed in a cyber environment, you need to keep your eye closely on competitive pressures, not least because if you want to achieve a sustained competitive advantage, you need to have a bundle of solutions that gives clear differentiated benefits to these customers in a way that none of your competitors can. So competition matters in terms of the three C's when it comes to customers in cyberspace. The next C is customers themselves. Customers are supposed to be kings and queens in cyberspace. Because of the major benefit of con convenience afforded by e-business frameworks and platforms, organizations that don't eventually end up delivering this fundamental benefit of convenience that is promised in any e-business proposition will not do too well with these customers. So if in brick and mortar formats, customers were supposed to be the center of all business activities, in cyberspace, this is even more the case. In cyberspace, customers are the single most important determinant of the success or failure of any e-business. Now the third C is chain. Chain because electronic commerce it's a new distribution channel. When we think about it in terms of creating a platform that gives access to products and services. Now, I did some work about eight years ago trying to understand the key motivations for bank, undergraduate bank customers in respect of opening and maintaining bank accounts in Ghana. What I found interestingly was that access to the bank was the single most important reason for opening and maintaining bank accounts. Now access was understood to mean both access to fiscal branches and access to electronic products and services delivered by the bank. So we need to understand that this chain that electronic commerce brings makes it paramount that we understand the management of both electronic and brick and mortar environments in order to achieve customer satisfaction. Now, let me now discuss various types or various models of e-commerce consumer behavior. Now, in e-commerce platforms, we have different consumer types. We have different purchasing types. And we have different purchasing experiences. Now, we have individual consumers. And then we have organizational buyers. The idiosyncrasies that characterize individual consumers can be markedly different from organizational buyers. You see, with individual consumers, Typically, the guy or the lady looking at the product will typically be the one who buys. But in organizational buying context, 
we have to deal with the phenomenon of the DMU, the decision-making unit, where you have a complex web of decision-makers when it comes to buying. You can have buyers, you can have users, you can have influencers, you can have purchasers, you can have gatekeepers. So you need to navigate this complex web of influencers and stakeholders if you are going to succeed with organizational buying, both in brick and mortar and electronic context. So we need to watch these things. When it comes to purchasing types, we have impulsive bias, we have patient bias, we have analytical bias. And all these bias have different profiles. Impulsive bias buy because it's all. Patient bias will wait when it's sale time. They may buy at sale time. They are not in a rush. So they are always looking for the best discounts. Analytical buyers can compare products from 15 different websites before making a decision. Then you can have utilitarian shopping experiences, and then you can also have hedonic shopping experiences. Now, for utilitarian buying, you buy usually because you want to achieve a specific goal. That's why it's utilitarian. With hedonic buy, you buy for pleasure. You buy because you love it. You buy because you love the experience. So we also need to understand the profile of these consumers if you want to do well with them as consumers in electronic co context. When it comes to the consumer decision-making process, there are a lot of variables that affect the consumer decision-making process in e-business e e e e e e uh, environments. We can have what we call social variables, where people are influenced by their family members, by their friends, by their co-workers, by what's fashionable now, by internet communities, by discussion groups. Anytime I'm traveling, my wife has a very interesting discussion with me of the black shoe with the, with the, with the red heel. Uh, I should go to this shop in the UK and buy this one. And before I leave, she would have done an intelligent uh, internet search and decided very broadly all oh, the places I should be visiting if, if I want to make her happy when I come back. So my wife is a very important influence on me. Oh, and my daughter as well. I have a daughter who's incredibly perceptive and is even more demanding than my wife when it comes to things that must be bought. So social variables really matter. Cultural idiosyncrasies also come into play. Huh? What, what is common to your identity, what you know from where you're coming from. I mean, certain cultural barriers mean that you, you, you don't want to go abroad and go and buy something that's seen as too expensive because the culture you come from is a modest culture. So there are all these things that come into play, things like government regulations, legal constraints. I mean, there are some things that you can't legally carry across borders. And things like availability of information. All these variables influence your decision-making process. And people play a role. I mean, when it comes to um, uh, the decision-making process, we have somebody we call the initiator. Now, what the initiator does is that they can first suggest or think of the idea of buying a particular product or service. You have influencers. A person whose advice of use carries some weight in making the final buying decision. You have deciders, you have buyers, you have gatekeepers. Now, these people, whilst they may matter in consumer, single consumer or individual purchase decision making, they are even more critical, like I alluded to earlier, when it comes to organizational buying decision making. And people want to succeed in e-marketing or e-commerce need to understand how to manage all these people and their very interest in order to close a sale. Now, consumer decision making goes through a variety of steps. Sometimes you have attention grabbing where 
you see something, you develop an interest in the product or service you've seen, then you make a decision to buy, and then you go and acquire the product or service. That's at the level of consumer decision making. Purchase decision making takes a, a similar, um, if you like, path in terms of finding out about the product, making, uh, searching for it, making a decision about it, and then committing to committing funds to actually consume the purchase. Now, in an earlier session, I, dis I discussed the fact that when you are purchasing from a source that's not human, from a source that's a technology intermediary, sometimes you may have some trepidation or anxiety. So what that means is that before you finally consummate the purchase, you may on occasion consult with others who may have bought from the same online store before or who have a prior experience with the particular institution you are buying for just to assure yourself that you're not buying from a fake person, from a fake entity, and your money will not be wasted. There are people who've sent money to all sorts of institutions where they didn't get any return because it was a fake website or these were fraudsters who were posing as business people on the internet. So we need to discuss how to achieve some level of customer satisfaction on the internet. Now, in cyber context, trust is everything, trust. And whether it's logistics or pricing or distribution or security issues or content issues or ease of access or completeness of the purchase or repeat purchase, for, for me, the critical issue in achieving customer satisfaction in e-context is the issue of trust, trust in the web shopping. So everybody engaged in e-commerce or e-business must strive to develop trust, not only in current consumers, but use them as advocates to tell prospective consumers about the security, about the authenticity of the person or the institution engaging in these e-commerce activities. Because while satisfaction in brick and mortar context typically has to do with comparing what you expected and what you got, in internet context, just the mere anxiety of did I buy it right? Will I see the same thing I saw on the internet? Will they send me a defective product? All those things mean that trust is key. And therefore, I would advise that those who engage in e-marketing should try hard to build a brand that is trustworthy. Use current purchases as consumer advocates. Put small, small videos on website to show how people were satisfied with the purchase they made. Make an extra effort to communicate trust as a way of helping to achieve consumer satisfaction in internet purchases. Now, in, a, in an electronic context as well, I alluded earlier to the phenomenon of uh, customization. And closely aligned to that is the concept of relationship marketing and then this whole thing about treating customers differently and making them feel like they are at the center of the organization's existence. Relationship marketing could be described as an overt attempt of exchange partners to build strong, sustainable, long-term associations characterized by purposeful cooperation and mutual dependence on the development of social as well as structural bonds. So relationship marketing is useful not just for customers, but for every value chain partner the organization is involved with, be it at the logistics end, be it at the human capital end, be it in the sales channels, or just by delivering superlative customer service. Now, the issue of treating customers differently should also be central to understanding consumers, cyber consumers, and configuring solutions that totally delight them. Treating customers differently means be able to change the manner products are configured 
of services delivered based on specific needs of individual customers. And when all these things are done, usually the output is customer loyalty. Now, I heard somebody on radio yesterday talking about how customer loyalty is no longer important in marketing and that, you know, these are old ideas. I beg to differ significantly because customers who are loyal, who stay with you for a long time, whose disposable incomes tend to improve as they grow, are always a good renewable source of profitability for any forward-looking organization. So apart from any other variable that you use to measure marketing success, I think customer loyalty, especially as they relate to profitable customers, is still something that everybody who is involved with e-marketing should take cognizance of and try to strengthen. Because all said, loyal customers give you repeat purchases and they give you increasingly bigger repeat purchases. So they help you to increase your profits, strengthen your market position, they over time can become less sensitive to price and they are an excellent source of referrals and therefore they improve your cross-selling chances. So I am totally for customer loyalty. And if you want to build and maintain customer loyalty, one of the things to do is to maintain continuous interactions between the consumers and the business. Make a commitment to provide all aspects of your business online, build different sites for different levels of customers, and be willing to invest both human and financial capital in information systems to ensure continuous improvement in supporting technology as it becomes available. Make a commitment as well to use the information collected about the customers in an ethical manner. But here, let me just make a quick comment on uh, making use of the information. Sometimes institutions in frontier markets collect all sorts of information about people and do nothing to use it to create emotional bonds that leads to higher customer loyalty. Look, if you have the information, use it in creative ways. A quick happy birthday, a quick check on how your month went, a quick happy Independence Day message, a quick check of how we can serve you better, all show that the information is being used to improve the customer experience. Also, set acceptable standards for response time in customer service and have an ability to change the customer information and services quickly and inexpensively. So for me, customer service, customer experience management is the way to go if you want to succeed at e-business. So customer service will mean that, look, customers have different options. They see you as being transparent. Um, you have a database that records their purchases, problems, and requests are easy to increase the customer experience so that as they go through their respective product life cycle, from inception to growth to peaking, we work with them and we deliver increasingly better customer experiences as they move through their life cycles. Now, for the products we also sell as well, we should know the ones that need to be removed from the existing catalogs, those that need to be added on, so that we monitor the product life cycle of these products to ensure that they are still relevant to the customers as they move along. Now, in implementing customer service in cyberspace, some of the typical functions that would be carried out by that customer service rule would be the answering of customer inquiries, providing technical information, letting customers track their accounts or order status, and allowing customers to customize their orders online. So if you want to address individual customer needs, you must understand their specific needs, their buying habits. Then customers can customize their future marketing orders, and then they keep doing business via the web. We can also what, do what we call create personalized web pages. You can have chat rooms, use email, use what, we refer, what is commonly referred to as FAQs. Frequently answered questions to deal with questions customers may have that tend to be frequent so they don't take a long time trying to understand the customer experience. We can establish help desks, call centers. It was dying, but I was hoping I'll get to the end, but I didn't get to the end. 
So the, com the computer is dead. So, look, when it comes to internet and consumer behavior, it's important to know that collecting information about customers, doing research on them, collecting data about them, establishing databases on them, is the single most important way to deliver excellent customer experiences. Without data, you can't improve the customer experience. So let's use the data we gather on customers not only to get them to buy more, but most profoundly help to improve their customer experience for them so they become advocates of that brand and they go out and tell others to come and patronize same. Thank you and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>